First epistle of John, chapter 2, commencing in verse 18. Now I read this in Greek before I came, and I'll only make brief references to the original language when applicable. Basically, we'll just look at it in English. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they were not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, Yeshua is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. Now in verse 20, you have an anointing. In the Greek text, okay, in the Greek text, the term Antichrist literally means pseudo-anointing, false anointing a lie posing as the anointing of God. But he's contrasting that to the anointing that faithful believers have. He's contrasting it to the anointing that faithful believers have. Now most of you know what the last hour means. I've explained this many times. The last hour is again the proverbial stopwatch. The time of the Gentiles is between 11.59 and 12. God stops the clock. This is the time period between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel's vision. When Israel is regathered as a nation, when Jews begin to return to Jesus again, you know the clock is going to begin to tick once again. Again, this is a extensive subject in itself. We have multiple teachings explaining it in some depth that you can avail yourself of in my books and on the internet. I don't want to go into things that most of you have already heard or already know. But there's a hiatus in the counting of time. There's a hiatus in the counting of time between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel's vision. It's been the last hour. It's been the last hour since the first century. Okay? Last as in escatos. Escatos. Now, we have a theological term in English, and again, my apologies to those who know this. The study of the last days is called eschatology, eschatology, as a theological term or as an academic term used in scholarly circles and so forth. The term, however, is something of a misnomer. Eschatos does not mean final. It means latter, latter the former days and latter days. We are told in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2, that we have been in the latter days since the time of Jesus. The former days being the old covenant, the latter days being the new. What Christians call the last days, they confuse with latter days. Jesus and the Olivet Discourse used a different term, the close of the age the close of the age, the real term for the last days as we would think of it, preparing for the return of Jesus, the sign of your coming, and the close of the age. We've been in the last days since Pentecost. Separate subject, <coughs> but related. Now let's look. Notice what it says. Antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists appear, and from this we know it's the last hour. The dawn of Antichrist is a sign of the last hour. 
of the last hour. Now, an hour is not a day or a longer period, it's a shorter period. There's a direct association between knowing it's the end and the increase in Antichrist. But there are many of them. There are many of them. They went out from among us. Remember, John always describes Antichrist in the character of Judas, the son of perdition. Again, my apologies to those who know these things from the book Shadows of the Beast and so forth. But let's look at this. Notice Antichrist and the appearance of many Antichrists is indicative that the Lord is coming. It's indicative that the Lord is coming. An increase in Antichrist activities. Now in the early church, one of the manifestations of Antichrist was docetism. Docetism. Those who denied that Jesus came physically. They said he appeared to be physical. Many people still buy into docetism in different aspects without knowing what it is. For instance, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus did not literally physically raise from the dead. They believe it was an image or a phantom. It was not actually him, per se, in a physical sense. This is docetus. Well, you can see him and he appears, but he has no physical substance. Jehovah's Witnesses still believe in a form of docetism. New Agers believe in docetism. Matria, the cosmic Christ. They believe in a form of docetism. We should not look for a physical Christ unless it's Matria, but nobody ever sees Matria, yet he's supposedly there. <laughs> well, if you understand Dominion theology, the doctrines of the Latter-day Reign movement, it is no coincidence that some of these people, like the Kansas City False Prophets and so forth, were teaching here in Britain in the, in, in the early 1990s, they were teaching Christ returns to the church before he returns for it. Uh, that the church is going to conquer the world before he comes and all this stuff that they have, the combination of reconstructionism and charismania and so forth, extreme charismatic experiential theology and all what they did, but they had this idea that the return of Jesus was initially not physical. There are evangelicals, people who had been, and now they're angry at me, friends of mine, who subscribe to the teachings of pain and wear. Pain and wear. They believe that just as Jesus appeared physically after his resurrection, but before his ascension, ten times, that he's going to come in some way ten times again, but it won't be his literal return. And this is the pain and wear teaching, and there are people who got caught up in it that I never would have thought of, would have, but they did. You know who I mean, yes? It's most unfortunate. These were people I thought were solid. There is docetism. It has come back even among people professing to be evangelicals. Even among people professing to be evangelicals. Now again, in Roman Catholicism, they teach Jesus returns in the flesh under the appearances of bread and wine, transubstantiation. That relates to docetism, but strictly speaking, it's not docetism. Uh, but docetism is around. It's, it's around, and it's even around among people who call themselves believers. It's certainly in cult groups, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's certainly in New Age, and it's certainly in Latter-day Reign, Manifest Sons, Man-Child, Dominion Theology Circles, people like this. Their, their essential views are docetists. Jesus will return physically the same as he left physically. When you see any kind of denial of this, 
when you see any kind of denial of this, you are dealing with an antichrist spirit. You understand? There's an antichrist spirit at work. Let's continue. First John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming and is now already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now again, when there's a spirit of error, it's because God has given people over to believe something false in judgment. Those who do not love a knowledge of the truth, he gives them over to believe the lie. Remember with, with Micaiah and, and the false prophets of Ahab, God made them believe the lie. Now speaking of Antichrist, this is what Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians concerning Antichrist. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is true. We see spirit of error in, in the book of Romans. It says three times the Lord gave the homosexuals and lesbians over to think it was natural, to think it was normal. When they're insisting on, on, on the normalcy of, of, of an unnatural sexual lifestyle, they're becoming more and more arrogant and more proud of, of, of something unnatural. They don't understand that God has given them over to it, that they've been given over to it. This is a spirit of error. When you see Antichrist, there will be a spirit of error, ultimately a spirit of error. Paul talks about this directly in 2 Thessalonians, as we'll look at in a moment. But let's look now. This whole concept, this whole notion, if it's of the Holy Spirit, confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, it's from God. Well, yes, it's talking about docetism. It's talking about docetism. But docetism is not purely something ancient. We have to understand this. I've explained this once some time ago here in Great Britain, that the errors in the early church make a comeback before the return of Jesus. In the early church, they were called Arians. They had an Arian Christology. They denied the deity of Christ. Today, we call them Jehovah's Witnesses. In the early church, we called them Sabathians. The Father's Jesus, Jesus is Jesus, the Holy Spirit is Jesus. Today, we call them United Pentecostals, Jesus only. Are you baptized only in the name of Jesus? In the early church, they were the Galatians, people trying to live under two covenants. Today, we call them Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm sorry to admit, but I have to, the extreme access of the excess of the, of the messianic movement, trying to put Gentiles under the law and live under two covenants. They're the same as the Galatians. They are neo-Galatians. None of these heresies are new. They all make a comeback in the last days, culturally modified perhaps, but the same core beliefs. Now, another heresy in the early church were the Marcionites, the followers of Marcion. We've explained this. 
They made a radical distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New, a radical distinction. And they developed a way of approaching the Bible, a hermeneutic, a way of interpreting the scriptures that reinforced this discontinuum between the God of the Old and the God of the New. In fact, the two covenants are both continuous and discontinuous. They're both evolutionary and revolutionary, but they come down on this idea of it's two different faiths virtually, trying to separate Christianity from, from Mosaic Judaism <coughs> and radically distinguish the church from Israel. Again, it's heads and tails. We must distinguish the church from Israel, but we cannot separate them. One being the children of God, the other being the people of God. We must distinguish, but we cannot separate. Nonetheless, Marcionism approaches the Bible to try to do this. Well, today we call Marcionites hyper-dispensationalists. You've seen the close brethren, yes, the, the exclusive brethren. Those people have a Marcionite hermeneutic, a Marcionite hermeneutic. They follow John Nelson Darby. You've heard me point this out. Their belief, the teaching of Darby, the epistle of James is not for Christians, it's for Old Testament Israel. The Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, that's for the Jews. And then they do the same thing with the Olivet Discourse, with Matthew 24, Luke 21. That's not for Christians, that's for the Jews. Well, that's nonsense. But you realize, and I'm not saying this by way of attack, I'm just stating it as a fact. Pre-tribulationism depends on that hermeneutic. It depends on saying Matthew 24 is not for the church. It depends on it. Well, if you ask the same people, do you think the epistle of James is part of the New Testament or the Old? They'd quickly say the New, most of them. Do you think the Sermon on the Mount applies to Christians? Oh, yes, they would say. Well, how come not the Olivet Discourse? Why not Matthew 24? Well, they've got a problem. There's an inconsistency. But this all goes back to Marcionism. All of these things existed in the ancient church, including docetism. But one way or another, they all end up with a false Christology, a false view of Jesus. Now notice what he's saying here. Another spirit, a false spirit. The true one, the true anointing of the spirit, the true Messiah, okay? A false Christ. Again, this always goes to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. The serpent beguiles the woman, Eve being a picture of the church and of Israel. Another gospel, another spirit, another Christ. Another gospel, another spirit, another Christ. I'm not going to talk about it specifically, but most of you know that Moriel has had to discharge a member of our team from South Africa. Well, he teaches, you can watch him teaching it, that God the Father never created anything. Only Jesus created. God the Father is not the creator. He never created anything. And he cites four verses, saying it's by Jesus, by Jesus, by Jesus, by Jesus. In three of those verses, it's a preposition through Jesus in the original Greek, and one is in Jesus. Nothing he said is true. None of it. None of it. The scriptures are clear that the Father created the world through the Logos, through his eternal Son. When you say that you have a Son that acts, operates independent of the Father, that is not the Jesus of Scripture. That is not even a wrong understanding of the real Jesus. The real Jesus is the reflection of the Father, dwells in him bodily. That he's, <laughs> He only does what he saw his Father doing. It's a different Jesus. Then you wind up with a different spirit. He's teaching you can pray the power of God's anointing 
you can pray it into a piece of cloth, into a tie or jacket, and knock people down Benny Hinn style. And he says, this is what Paul did. Well, it doesn't say that Paul prayed the power into it. In the Greek mood does not even allow for, the Greek case, sorry, does not even allow for that. It's accusative. It was something that God did through Paul, but Paul did not invoke her to do it. This idea that Paul prayed the power in, and therefore we can pray the power into a tie or a jacket and knock people down because the power of God's in the fabric, this is not the Holy Spirit. This is shamanism. This is witchcraft. This is what South Africans call muti. You believe, this, Catholics have the scapula. You believe in an empowerment of fabric that is spiritually energized. This is not the Holy Spirit, different spirit. And then he goes on, and he's saying, in the millennium, the blood of Jesus will not be efficacious to forgive sin. The millennial sacrifices are not memorials of the cross. Instead, propitiation will be by the blood of animals. It says in Hebrews 13, 20, the blood of Jesus is eternally efficacious and that the blood of animals can never take away sin. He's got another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. But he was really good at putting it over. He got by people. You wouldn't think somebody could get by. He got by up to a point now. He got by Bill Randall's. He got by Dave Royal, he got by me, he got by CMFI, he got by discerning people up to a point. Remember Judas, the son of perdition? Just like the Antichrist, Lord is it I, Lord is it I? They are able to deceive even the elect up to a point. Now those who look to Jesus will not be taken in. But those who get seduced the way the woman was seduced by the serpent, they will. In the last days, this activity increases. It increases. There'll be more and more people trying to infiltrate the church with this spirit of seduction. And you'll see, they'll have a false Christology. They'll believe something fundamental about Jesus that's wrong. Something. To say that, that, that Jesus acted independent of his Father and the Father is not the Creator, never created anything? <laughs> well, that's not what Jesus taught, is it? Well, let's look now. Let's continue. Look with me to Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs, that's false messiahs, and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, okay, in Matthew 24. But in verse 15, we see, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, notice the activity of Antichrist is bifunctional. It is aimed at Israel. It involves the deception of Israel. And it involves the attempted deception of the church. Antichrist seeks to deceive Israel, national ethnic Israel, and seeks to deceive the church in every instance. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. Verses 1 to 4. Mm -hmm. 
Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the parousia, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering, our episunagage, together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or disturbed either by a spirit or a message, or a letter as if from us to the effective day of the Lord has come. He's speaking here to believers. Some Jewish, most not Jewish. Gentile God-fearers. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy that comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Revelation chapter 11, the millennial temple. You see, he's out to deceive the church. He's out to deceive the Jews. Revelation chapter 13. Verse 14 and verse 18. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which he was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound and of the sword who's come to life. Again, we deal with this in shadows of the beast. He counterfeits the resurrection. Look at verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Let you as wisdom. Well, whoever those people are, if they had wisdom, and there was a pre-trib rapture, they wouldn't be here either. <laughs> it's only the people of God who are going to have that kind of wisdom. That involves a Gematrian, a Greek, a Greek Gematrian, a Hebrew Gematria and things like this. You can get the book, but I don't have it completely figured out, but I do believe by the grace of the Lord, more and more people are seeing it clearer. And again, there's something for the church, something for the Jews. There will be a faithful, faithful constituency of believers within the church who will see through it. And there will be a faithful remnant of Israel who will see through it. But most of Israel is not going to see through it until it's too late. And most of Christendom are not going to see through it until it is too late. They won't see it until it's too late. Now, I just don't mean the nominal church. I mean people who profess to be regenerate, who profess to be believers. Remember, there are many antichrists. There are these two ultimate beasts in Revelation. But there's a spirit that's always been in the world that John spoke of. Yet this spirit gains momentum in the last days. It is happening now. How do we make sense of these things? First John says, love not the world, the cosmo. But it also says, neither the things of the world, the cosmon. The words are related. Cosmos, cosmon the system of the world, <laughs> the way the world works. Worldliness does not have to do with things. It always has to do with our attitude towards things. It's not about material possessions or wealth or anything. It's not to do with sex or power. Or, not to do with anything. Or culture. It's not to do with any of those things, but it is everything to do with our attitude 
towards those things, with our attitude towards those things. That is the cosmon. The cosmon sucks people into trusting in the cosmos, a fallen world. The cosmon seduces people into the cosmos. Well, let's look further. Someone sent me a clip this week, and it was on some web pages. That a teacher was in trouble, legally, for teaching historical facts about Mohammed that he was a pedophile. There were criminal prosecutions in Australia about five years ago of a former Muslim, criminally prosecuted for stating the historical facts about Muhammad's relationship with Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, which is in the Hadith, in Islamic literature. The fact that it was in Islamic literature that it's in Muslim history, that it's in their holy books. It's your religion, it's what you teach. Did not prevent a Christian from being criminally prosecuted in an English-speaking democracy for pointing it out. <laughs> this is insane, isn't it? This is insane. I'm only reading what's in your book because... I'm offended. Well, you're offended by your book? How can a society think that's, forget about rational, forget about just, how can they think it is anything but ridiculous? Spirit of error. Spirit of error. In California, you can get in legal trouble giving someone a straw in a restaurant. Giving someone a straw in a restaurant because of Green Party political activists demanded a law that you can, okay. Now, the logical thing to do would be to get biodegradable straws, you know instead of plastic ones. But this is a fine. And in certain cases, it could be even prosecutable. But you know what's legal in California? To register an illegal alien to vote, and they're there and they're in the country illegally and getting social benefits with no right to be in the country, taking jobs away from Mexican Americans, taking jobs away from black Americans. <laughs> But the state says we have to protect them in cities of refuge from being deported, even though they're taking jobs away from Mexican Americans <laughs> and, and from black Americans. That's who gets hurt by it economically. Now, businesses love illegal aliens because they have to work below minimum wage. You've got to pay a, an African American or a Mexican American legal wages and benefits. You can pay these other people what you can pay them. <laughs> they're just there. to pay substandard wages to people, artificially depresses wages. Wait a minute, what about our own Mexicans? What about the Mexicans who were born here? I, uh, oh, the, uh, we're gonna give them a city. You can have a late-term abortion in California, a partial birth abortion, a baby capable of surviving, but arbitrarily aborted, by dragging it to the birth canal with forceps, boring a hole suboccipitally through the skull, inserting a suction catheter, and sucking the baby's brains out, and it's legal. It's legal! But don't you give somebody a straw. Now you understand, this is California. This is where Silicon Valley is. This is the high-tech center of the world. 
professing to be wise, they become fools. How could you be so stupid? Stupid as it is, it will become more like this. Become more like this. Let's see. Unelected bureaucrats and judges in Europe can tell you who you have to let into your country, set quotas on agricultural production and fishing, penalize the British farmer for having the most productive farms in Europe in order to reward farmers in countries with less productive ones, drive the cost of manufactured goods and most commodities and consumer durables up 8 to 10 percent, above what they would be otherwise. And you're wondering, should you stay in the EU? <laughs> so stupid. Now when the people weren't so stupid, go into crisis mode. Try Irish politics. In Ireland they have referendums. Providing the political establishment gets the result it wants. If it doesn't, they hold another referendum. And sometimes a third one, and once in a while, a fourth one. Until the people have decided. <laughs> now they want to do it here, don't they? Another Brexit? What's happening? How is it like this? Telling people there's democracy where there is none. A country that votes Brexit obviously should have a Brexit prime minister. But no, you want a non-Brexit prime minister and then she almost loses an election to the devil's son. <laughs> Only the Northern Irish save Britain and she's still the head of the party and the prime minister. <laughs> a job she shouldn't have to begin with. Well, look, I'm not trying to be political, but why is this happening? There are forces of spiritual seduction on back of this stuff. I was just talking to someone. Forget about the Second World War. Forget about Napoleon or the Spanish Armada. The British quest to be independent of Europe goes back to Boadicea. You know that? It literally goes back to Boadicea. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Celtic Britain, like Cornwall and Scotland, most Wales, they were never part of the European Empire anyway. <laughs> they were never part of the European Empire, uh, the Roman Empire anyway. Never. Well, we know from Daniel there's something happening here. Let us see how the stage is being set. The 20th and into the 21st century has seen the rise of the most brutal, genocidal, mass murdering dictators in history. Because of the Blitz and the Holocaust, people in Britain personify Adolf Hitler as the next thing to Satan. And I can understand that. But Joseph Stalin killed two and a half as many times as many people. Some would say three times as many. Nobody is sure. 
Mao killed 40 million. 40 million! What did Mao, Joseph Stalin, and Adolf Hitler all have in common? They were all Darwinists, and they were all socialists. <laughs> All Darwinists and all socialists. Nobody can deny that they were socialists. Nobody can deny they were Darwinists. And nobody can deny that it was in the name of those two things that they tried to lend rational credence to their actions and policies. That's what they did. For a number of years, you've heard me and maybe other people say, East goes West and West goes East. Federalism collapsed in Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, these multinational states fragmented and broke up. The UK is on the precipice of breaking up. Scotland, Wales have their own, Northern Ireland have their own parliaments. Federalism is declining. Federal states in Eastern Europe. Socialism was seen as a failed experiment in the former Warsaw Pact nations. People in Hungary and Poland and Romania, they hate communism. They hate socialism. They don't want it. They know what it is. They know it didn't work. Well, people in Eastern Europe give those things up. People in Western Europe want to embrace them. <laughs> Doesn't make a lot of sense. If it didn't work there, why is it going to work here? Latin America, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Hugo Chavez, guess where they are now? <laughs> what did they do? What did the Sandinistas do? Now again, I know about the abuses of capitalism. I know there's faults in every system. Man has fallen. But the fact that it's given the most personal freedom and the highest standard of living to the most people, despite its faults, that's not the issue. The issue is socialism has never worked because it is predicated on a Darwinist ideal. As capitalism came from feudalism, they said socialism would come from capitalism, and it didn't happen. Marx was wrong, proven wrong. Communism did not begin in Britain, the first capitalist country. It began in Russia, the last feudal country. Everybody knows that. But you weren't allowed to teach it in the Soviet Union. They had to engage in revisionism and rewrite history. Because it didn't fit the narrative. What I propose is this. The stage is being set for Antichrist. In society, in Israel, and in the church. Let's begin. The narrative. You must preserve. That's not dark enough. You must at all costs preserve the narrative. 
It doesn't matter what the facts say. It doesn't matter what reality says. Only the narrative matters. Today, we call it Olenskyism. Barack Obama was an Olenskyist. Hillary Clinton, Olenskyism. But Olenskyism is only Nazism. Goebbels did the same thing, Hitler's propaganda minister. Tell a lie often enough, and people will think it is the truth. Stick to the narrative. Forget about fact. Forget about reality. Stick to the narrative. <coughs> You're pro-life. You're a misogynist. You're part of the war against women. Just keep repeating that. No, I'm pro-baby. Doesn't matter. You're against women. In the United States now, more women are opposed to non-therapeutic abortion than support it. We don't want to hear that. Doesn't fit the narrative. You're against women. Yeah, but these are women saying... Fifty-three percent of American women voted for Donald Trump. We don't want to hear that. Doesn't matter. You're against women. You stick to the narrative. This was Pravda and its Vestia, the two news publications of the former Soviet Union. Pravda means truth in Russian. Unbelievable. And it's Vestia. Truth is not what actually happens. Truth is defined as a political decision by the party. <laughs> Whatever the party decides is truth, is truth. Wait a minute, abortion is killing the unborn. No, it's women's reproductive rights. <laughs> it's pro-death. No, it's pro-choice. That's the narrative. We stick to the narrative. That's what happens. Second way, this is happening. Now you understand this mentality is setting society up. Not only that, but texting. That kind of communication lends itself to sound bites, to cliches. You understand? It lends itself to mantras. So it becomes technologically facilitated, reinforced. Just go by the cliche, just keep repeating this. Well, this gets in the church. We have the victory! We're going forth in triumph! Hallelujah! Now is the time of us to march upon the land. We're building a kingdom of power, not of war. No, you're not. Look at the newspaper. <laughs> That's not the narrative. Yeah, but it's the mantra. <laughs> you understand. Israel. 
the Jews have repeatedly ended up the proverbial man on back of the eight ball. Goes back to Jacob. Very clever. He counter maneuvered Laban. Resourceful. Yet he wound up in a dark night of the soul. It was only God's intervention that saved his neck. The Jews would have been wiped out at least 20 times in the last two and a half thousand years. The Jews would have been wiped out at least 20 times apart from divine intervention. <laughs> in the 1967 war, they thought it was because of them. Oh, no. It was because of God and because of the stupidity of Islam and the corruption of the Soviet Union who backed it. That, 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 that's what happened. The glorification of Zionism and the glorification of Judaism. Now, I believe in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. I believe in Zionism. But I do not believe in the glorification of Zionism. And I certainly don't believe in Talmudic Judaism. But that's not the mantra! The mantra, I'm Israel, hi, I'm Israel, hi, I'm Israel, I'm Israel, I'm Israel. No, I'm Israel lies. It's God's undeserved grace. It's his promise to your fathers. That's why you have survived. The narrative. The all-encompassing narrative. The next way it works is education. Education, educa, co-equally comes from two Latin words. Educare and educere. Etymologically similar, but two different meanings. Educere To lead out. To prepare someone to go out and make it on their own. Using their own abilities, their own resources, their own intelligence. That's educere. But then there is educere. To mold, to mold, educere is when you use education to teach someone how to think. Educare is where you use education to teach someone not to think. It is about conditioning. Now this is not a new problem. Although state schools in Britain, called public schools in America, were established 
under Christian principles from the influences of early Methodism to give literacy and numeracy to working classes. That is true. They became conditioning plants to breed workers for labor-intensive industries. You understand? Don't think, just do this, dig in the coal mine. It was there. The teacher was like the foreman, the whole bit. Pavlov's dog, the bell rings. This is not a new problem. The elite, however, the children of the wealthy had different schools. Grammar school, public schools. They were taught to be the managers, the entrepreneurs, the whatever. Today, educare. Taxpayer funded schooling in the United Kingdom and the United States is not there to teach people how to think, it's to teach them not to think, to stick to the narrative. Teachers unions on both sides of the Atlantic are political campaign funds for left-wing political parties. What these schools are for is social engineering. They are taken over by an antichrist spirit. You must teach Darwinism. You cannot teach the alternative to it. You must teach little children homosexuality and lesbianism are normal. You cannot teach the alternative to it. Etc. 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 It is there to mold people not to think, certainly at least, not to think outside of the box into which they are placed. They hate charter schools. They hate home schools. They hate faith-based private schools. Church-run schools, unless it's the C of E, or the Roman Church, you know, the pedophile academies, they're all right. But a school that teaches God as the creator, and a school that teaches Adam and Eve instead of Adam and Steve, that's not the narrative. But you have to understand, there is an antichrist spirit on back of this stuff. Just like Zechariah shows us what Nehemiah and Ezra and Haggai were seeing taking place historically, Zechariah pulls back the curtain and shows us what's happening in heaven at the same time. The book of Daniel shows us that the political events on the earth are a mere reflection of the conflicts in the heavenlies. So what happens to education? It happens through media. And social media. Media. Again, not a new situation. This has gone on in newspaper dynasties to the time of Citizen Kane, if you've ever seen the film about William Randolph Hearst. It's not a new problem, but now it's perfected to an art form. 
There's no BBC News. There's no CNN News. The news is not reported. It is editorialized along the line of the biases the establishment wants people to subscribe to. Be it selling out to Europe or whatever. The news is not reported. It is editorialized. Or if there is something that threatens the interests of those who want to perpetuate the narrative, it's either underreported or ignored. A court in Europe decreeing a teacher is guilty for teaching historical fact because Muslims objected to it. In my youth, I was a radical socialist. It was different then. There were reasons. We saw in the States, the Vietnam War. And while Americans were being drafted and sent to Vietnam with no right to vote yet, the American government was having detente with Russia and China who were supplying the North Vietnamese with the hardware to kill Americans. At the same time, the American government was telling you to go fight the communists. They were same corporations making money. <coughs> telling you go fight the communists is your patriotic duty while well, they're trading with the communists. Young black guys would go to Vietnam and come back and not be able to go to university in Alabama or Mississippi because they were black after supposedly fighting for the country. This drove my generation to the left, you understand? <coughs> there was a reason it happened. Now, eventually I saw through it. But I'd supported militant black organizations like the Black Panthers and things like this. I supported them when I was a teenager. Now understand this. A brief lesson in American history and of course British colonial history. Let's just be honest about it. In the American South under slavery, a black was considered three-fifths human by law. So white plantation owners in the South who were all Democrat, the Democratic Party was the party of slavery, could vote their slaves for the candidate of their choice who would always be a Democrat. There were people called Uncle Toms, blacks who collaborated with the plantation owners whose money and investment from the cotton trade was in England, in Britain. You see this in the film Gone with the Wind as the back tells you some of the background of what was happening at that time. And that was it. This is how you vote if you're black. <laughs> That's what they did. They voted how they were told. It was always Democrat. Three-fifths. Black men were breeding stock. They were studs. Send them back to the field. The United States outlawed the importation of slavery well before the American Civil War, so you had to breed them internally. That's what they did. Now, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, but it was the Republicans, it was Abraham Lincoln who stopped this, you understand, it wasn't Democrats. <laughs> after the Civil War, after emancipation, came Reconstruction. But it was the same thing. Slavery with a different name. You just found a way to lock a black guy up, put him on a chain gang. <laughs> Mm 
it just continued with a different name. Now, under Bill Clinton, the black American prison population tripled. What do you do with a black? Well, three out of four black American children are born out of wedlock. He's just a stud. The others are on welfare. He's just a breeding stock. Lock him up, put him in chains, handcuff him, send him back to jail. <laughs> Can't get a job, you gave it to an illegal alien. <laughs> so you get Uncle Tom's. Barack Obama and these guys, vote Democrat. It's the same thing that's always happened, you understand? It's the same thing. Hold the black man down, hold the Hispanic down, the American Indian, it's always the same game. But the narrative is, no, listen to Uncle Tom. <laughs> this is getting worse. What's really odd is Hispanics and blacks who see through this and who try to warn and say, look, this is a lie. They're hated by the black establishment who have a vested interest as Uncle Tom's collaborating with this corruption. Well, it's the narrative. It's the media. Then you have the gentrification. San Francisco is a mess, but there are nice neighborhoods, and a lot of those nice neighborhoods used to be slums. Now, property developers buy those slums for a song or a pittance, often with the taxpayer subsidy, redevelop them as housing for people who work in Silicon Valley which is in the suburbs of San Francisco. So instead of having people in the suburbs commuting to work in the city, you have people live in the city and commute to work in the suburbs. They have Google buses, and it's the opposite of traditional social economic environment. They work in the suburbs, live in the cities. Who gets forced out of these neighborhoods? Blacks and Hispanics. Who runs this system? Who funds it? George Soros. Mark Zuckerberg. Jeff Bezos, who not only runs Amazon, he owns the left-wing Washington Post. Why will billionaires, multi-billionaires, fund a left-wing political party? Why will the banksters of Wall Street want Clinton and Obama? Why? Because it's in their interest. <laughs> if you can bamboozle people into following the narrative, oh no, they're, they're for the rich, we're for the people, we're anti-fa, we're per it's all a lie. It's all a lie. There's super wealthy people pushing this. You think they're doing it because they're idealists? You think they're allowing people to come into the United States from Central America illegally to take jobs away from Mexican Americans because they're idealists? No, they want to pay the cheap wages. So the next thing that happens is victimization. You're the victim. You're in this situation because you're the victim. 
a child born out of wedlock in the United States of any race is much less likely to finish high school and much more likely to wind up in the criminal justice system at some point in his youth. You are the victim that three out of four Afro-American children are born out of wedlock? The civil rights movement came out of Christianity. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference. These were people who had faith-based values. That's all gone. Now, you're the victim. South Africa. Apartheid has been over for 20 years or more. You're the victim. What's happening? Afro-American unemployment, I'm sorry, African, black African unemployment has more than doubled since the end of apartheid. Black underemployment is incalculable. Infant mortality has gone through the roof. Longevity has gone through the basement. Now, I was deeply, outspokenly opposed to apartheid. It was racist and unjust. But after 20 years of the ANC, the average black is far worse off. You know David Royal, yeah, we take care of AIDS kids in Africa. Uganda is the same. The tribalism is not the fault of European colonialists that you see in Kenya and in Uganda and in Tanzania. But you've got to perpetuate the victim mentality. Now, countries that do not do that. Has anybody been to Singapore? What was Singapore in the late 1960s? A slum cluttered island. What is Singapore now? It's unbelievable. Don't be the victim. Be the victor. Upward mobility, work, study. Perpetuate the victim mentality. They do it in Northern Ireland with the Catholics. They do it in Northern Ireland with the Catholics. You perpetuate the victim mentality. As long as you make somebody think that they're the victim perpetually, to the point where they don't have to be responsible for their own actions and own decisions. They will always remain the low man on the totem pole. And you'll always have their vote. <laughs> because you're showing sympathy to the victim. They redefine morality. Instead of you get married and you have children within the confines of wedlock, and you bring them up in a stable family, and they have a father who's a role model, and things like this, no, you destroy the family. Instead of morality being defined by personal righteousness, <laughs> moral living, morality becomes redefined as your position on social policy. <laughs> are, you, are you green enough? <laughs> Now, all these things I'm telling you seem like mere social commentary. They seem to be merely socio-political commentary. But understand something. There is a spirit on back of this stuff that is setting the stage for the Antichrist and false prophet. Remember, you'll be brought before magistrates and kings. We've pointed this out before. You replace legislative or parliamentary government
with bureaucratic and judicial government. Bureaucratic, executive, and judicial government. It's not parliament or congress. It's executive orders ruling by fiat. Barack Obama made a treaty with Iran. Yeah, but it's not constitutional. The Senate has to approve the treaty. Oh, yeah, but he did it by fiat. Mr. Trump got rid of it. He shouldn't have done that. No, the treaty should have been made to begin with unless it was approved by the Senate. Executive? What's happening with Theresa May? Is it parliamentary or is it executive? Bureaucratic. An entrenched bureaucracy making the real decisions in Brussels. And when it's challenged in court, the judicial. <laughs> Judges who legislate from the bench, replacing the legislative and parliamentary. Now understand this, when you get to issues like pro-life, Mr. Trump, for instance, knows judges are going to decide these things. The American people never would have voted for same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court imposed it. Therefore, he's got to get conservative judges. You saw the thing with Kavanaugh over here in the news. And they were... There's a spiritual battle on back of that dealing with abortion and other things. The whole thing with moving the embassy to Jerusalem is another dimension. The next thing that happens in preserving the narrative, pay attention, is what George Orwell called newspeak, what we call political correctness. Call it what you want. You redefine things. I'll give you an example. Redefinition of language. Comes from something called deconstructionism associated with the French Jewish philosopher in the 1960s. Somebody of considerable fame at that time, Jacques Derrida. Scientifically, male and female, term is sex. It has to do with chromosomal identity, X and Y. Yes. Scientifically, sex can only be chromosomally determined as X and Y. That's it. However, in the Greek language, to a degree in Latin language and in certain other European languages, the masculine can take the feminine form, and the feminine can sometimes even take a masculine form. For instance, in Spanish, mapa, well, that should be a feminine word, but you don't say la mapa, you say el mapa. It takes the masculine article, doesn't it? El mapa. It's verdad. El mapa. In Greek, the masculine of rock is Petros. But Jesus is called in Corinthians the Petra. Gender is not to do with sex as a linguistic term. Gender is to do with the way a word is used in the construction or context of a sentence. Gender. 
We call it masculine feminine, or in some languages, masculine feminine or neuter, but it's not about X and Y. It's about the way a word is used in a particular context that determines if it's masculine or feminine. So, in deconstructionism, you replace the term sex with gender. <laughs> Gender identity. <coughs> you can't say sexual identity because that would mean that the chromosomes in every cell in someone's body is going to determine if they're male or female. Being surgically altered to resemble someone of the natural opposite sex is not going to change the DNA in every cell of someone's body. Scientifically, you can't do it! So you do it with semantics. You do it with language. You make the term gender, a linguistic term, into a pseudo-scientific term. You understand? In deconstructionism of Derrida, it began as a literary form of literary criticism where the assumptions about identity and truth are brought into question because words are thought to refer to other words. This gained momentum among left-wing intellectuals, particularly in France, and then began permeating the academic establishment of other countries, including Britain and America. Okay. You deconstruct the traditional meaning and give a new one. <laughs> well... What happens when this gets into the church? When people in word faith churches that follow the money preachers, when they use words like faith and victory and even prosper, they mean something quite different than the scripture means by those terms. Now, this also can relate to Gnosticism, where some people mean diff different things by the same terms than you do, but keeping it philosophical. They'll use terms with a different definition. You deconstruct traditionally held understandings of identity and truth. Well, constitutionally, deconstructionists hate the Constitution. They hate any kind of Constitution. The American Constitution, like the British Magna Carta, any of these things, they are all theistic documents. And it was understood at the time of their framing, drafting, and signing that they referred to the God of the Judeo-Christian Scriptures. That has to be deconstructed. <laughs> you understand? It could be the God as I understand him, or the God as I'm. It could be the God, it could be Buddha, it could be... This is Prince Charles. Prince Charles. It goes on. Now look. What happens again when it gets in to the church? Left-wing evangelicals. Has any of you heard of the American Tim Keller? Huh? You understand what this is? It's 
Deconstructionism applied theologically as well as politically. You deconstruct the original understanding of the meaning. You attack the foundations. You teach it in schools. Dictatorial pastors, egomaniacs, religious narcissists, people like Steve Furtick. He's, he's, he's the worst I personally have seen, but he's not the only one. What's on back of this stuff? Well, the narrative. It's always the narrative. But it's not God's narrative. It's the narrative of the cosmos. It's the narrative of the cosmona. It is the narrative driven by a spirit of Antichrist that is setting the stage for the Antichrist. That's what it is. It relates to many things. To the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. It relates to many things. It relates to the technosphere. It relates to many things, but it comes down to one basic thing that First John tells us. The cosmos and the cosmon, the system, the narrative, the myth treated as fact. In the first century, the demon possessed by sexual emperor Caligula said his daughter was a son, and arranged a marriage ceremony to a horse, legally recognized. <laughs> you want to talk about animal rights? <laughs> the difference is, in those days, Although it was legally established, that's how far the Roman Empire went into depravity. Now, in the last days, or in these days, such things can to a degree be technologically facilitated. You understand? At least the illusion of it. There was no way then to make a male resemble a female surgically. Now they can do it. I can understand this. I used to be a man trapped in a woman's body. <laughs> but then I was born. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not the only one who said that, believe me. You understand what this is? Before John talks about Antichrist, and many Antichrists, and we will know it's the end when this Antichrist stuff begins to intensify and multiply in preparation for the arrival of the Antichrist and the false prophet. We know that this is preceded, verse 16, by the cosmos and the cosmos. Now there's something else. <laughs> Do you know how many people doing this stuff, not all of them, but a disproportionately large percentage of them or Jewish. Now they will not tell you, anti-Semites will not tell you that the people opposing it, like Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager and Mark Levin and 
Michael Savage, they won't tell you that the people who are opposing it and warning against it are disproportionately, disproportional numbers Jewish also. They won't tell you that. The antique Semites will just say Jews are doing this, 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 this. You understand? Yet there's no question. The same as there's a disproportionate number of Jews warning against it. There's a disproportionate number of left-wing Jews doing it. Soros being one. Zuckerberg. There's a final thing they are doing now. Deplatformization. And I will leave with this. In deplatformization, Norwegian cruises have done this. MasterCard has done this. Facebook has done this. It gets worse and worse. So many of them are doing it. Universities are doing this. You deprive dissenting voices of a platform to put across the opposing point of view. The fact that Darwinism is not scientific, you can't say that. It's not the narrative. You cannot have a scientist who will challenge it, deplatform them. Antifa are the most fascist people in the world. They're anti-free speech. They do not want intelligent debate. They want people reacting emotionally. Not people who think, but people who've been conditioned by the school system not to think. The universities want people who can't think. So they ban conservative speakers, pro-life speakers, anything like this. Of two things we may be sure. The Menlaus effect. Menlaus the Jew collaborated, as Daniel predicted, with Antiochus. Major picture of the Antichrist. The abomination. Menlaus is coming back big time. You will see a betrayal of the Jewish people and of Israel facilitated by left-wing Jews. It's already begun in America. It is already begun in the United States. And you will see a betrayal of the body of Christ, not just by left-wing so-called Christians, but by left-wing professing, professing evangelicals. Gary Burge, Stephen Sizer, Tim Keller, and others, and more to come. That is what is happening. It'll go against Israel. It'll go against the church, the true church. The left-wing Jews will attack traditional Jewish identity, Jewish preservation. The same thing will happen within the church. Our identity, our very identity in Christ will be challenged and is being challenged. By people like Steve Chalk in this country, it's happening. No, there's a reason. There's a reason where it says, before this Antichrist, it's prefaced, love not the cosmos, neither the cosmon. Understand this. It is the world's system. It is demonically operated. The world is in the power of the wicked one. When you read a newspaper and don't read one, read this. You cannot believe them. You can't believe them, but you can believe this. This you can believe. 
the cosmos and the cosmo. This is the reality. These trends you see in society, in governments, Brexit, the hatred of Trump, all these things, they are reflections of spiritual conflicts and they all concern us. Every one of these things concerns us. We are supposed to understand this. You can't understand the cosmos unless you understand the cosmon. Tonight, in a nutshell, I hope by the grace of God, I've done my best to make sure you understand it, to explain it to you. We are not to be naive about these things. If you've watched This Week in Prophecy, our last one, it hinged on a verse in Daniel, and then we'll go to sleep. Turn with me to Daniel 2, please. <laughs> Verse 21. It's he who changes the times and the epics. That's the Lord. He removes kings and establishes kings. He's responsible with governments. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. Ultimately, the Lord is the Lord of these events. It doesn't happen unless he allows it. Sometimes he causes it. But he wants us. He wants you and he wants me to be wise men and women. He gives us wisdom. Jesus is our wisdom. And knowledge to men and women of understanding. This is not just an academic lecture. Make sure you understand this. The cosmos and the cosmon. God bless. Have a good night.